Hello and welcome to Homemakers Radio. This is designed to use as you walk or as you work. And if you would click the link in the description box below, you can go to the post on which I am embedding this video for you so you can see the s summarization and pictures and other things on the post that go with the video. And today before you go about your work, whether you are sorting something or whether you're just going for a walk or whether you're just sitting, I want to share my teacup with you. It's called, it, it's a Royal Albert, it has no name. Most Royal Albert series had names like Old Country Roses or, or Prairie Rose or uh, Violet Rose, things like that. And this one doesn't have a name, so I suspect it was just a, a gift cup and uh, it goes with my dress. Now I think I got this fabric at Joanne's. I, I'm really not sure. Uh, Hobby Lobby maybe. But I made it with an Elizabeth Lee pattern. Those were the ones that were made for women who were expecting or nursing. And I made it for my daughter and I asked her not to get rid of them when she was finished to, to give them back and I could alter them and wear them myself if they weren't too worn. So I wanted to show you this pattern here and very Jane Austeny I think has a, a high waist uh, little seam up here. It's very very much Regency and so when I wear it I feel so Jane Austeny especially since I'm going to be reading about her today and uh, but I didn't quite make it into Jane Austen herself. I'm more like the maid. And so I wanted to show you the dress. And it's very long and it is great for the home, 100% cotton. And I'm wearing my little Jane Austen boots with it, with it. And I also made a piping for the neckline, which I have to explain about piping. It goes between, it goes between the layers. It goes between the facing and the outer piece here. The raw edges are tucked in between. You have to turn it a certain way in the machine to get it to work. So I hope you are doing well. I almost hate to ask and we are living in a tumultuous time aren't we? But let's see if we can keep that storm out of our homes. And so just for a little bit, just for the time that I'm speaking to you, let's just chuck it all and listen uh, to something that is a little bit more worthwhile. We can create something different for ourselves. We don't have to be subjected to the world's plan for us. It's hard though, isn't it? I know every time we turn around, even if you don't listen to the media, somebody's going to tell you something. You can't get away with it, away from it. But one of the best ways to get clarity in your mind is to go for a stroll. And I'm not going to say go for a walk anymore because that evokes thoughts of um, athletic effort and walking, even watching people walk past on the farm road. I know what they're doing. They're, they're going out for exercise and uh, they're wearing their exercise clothes and they are walking in a certain way. They're trying to toughen up their muscles and so I just would suggest you use it and go for a stroll. Now I was really impressed with Brian Kozlowski's book, The Jane Austen Diet, because he mentioned in the chapter I read to you about the fresh air, how often it's mentioned in her novels of going out for a breath of air or how he just needs more air. We used to say stuff like that. And how they went outside to appreciate the outdoors, just to appreciate it. Now this sounds a bit silly, doesn't it? Let's go outside and just appreciate the flowers and just appreciate the, the trees and the bushes and the hedges and and the fruit that has come out. And But it was considered, and I still believe it is, considered a waste. You, we've wasted it if we haven't appreciated it. So that is the best way to get some clarity back into your mind is to just go outside. Even if all you do is stand on your front stoop for a minute, sit on the front porch, and just appreciate what is around you. And so the other way I think is so important, you know we often pray at last instead of at first. We look for all kinds of ways to solve something and then we at last pray. But why don't you think about praying at first instead of at last and pray God will put you in a right mind and in mental stability. We all need that. I think most of us are afraid of, 
uh, going into the abyss of madness. And we, but we aren't going to do that. And you keep listening here, and uh, you'll keep me sane too, because I know I have to behave myself when I come here. <laughs> so, um, so I I would just really suggest that I've already been out this morning, and I'm trying to do the Jane Austen thing and going out before breakfast. Now that is quite a, an achievement because everything gets to going pretty fast and it means going getting up when it's still not quite completely light and it's quite enchanting actually and we miss out on a lot when we don't observe all of the stages of God's day and so that has been quite interesting you get to hear the first chirp of the birds you get to hear the first noises and before all the before all the tractors start up <laughs> so one of the problems we're having today is anxiety because we don't know what's going to happen to us. We don't know if we're, most people don't even know if they're going to be able to live in their own house. And so what we want to do with anxiety is begin this uh, deliberate, conscientious, mindful, purposeful movements and purposeful living, starting out with your, with getting dressed and and thinking about what you're doing, not just throwing on something, but thinking about it, doing it carefully, being thankful for everything that you that you use. And you know, in these days when it's harder to to get the products you want, it's very easy to be thankful for little things. And so that's how you can overcome the anxiety. And the other thing is, go to uh, some place and do some chair exercises. I know. Um, you're not elderly, but some of you who aren't used to exercise might respond really well to chair exercise because all they do is is move a little bit and stretch a little bit and it makes a big difference in your mind. And uh, we have to preserve our minds. We have to keep our minds. You know, God gave us our minds and we have to protect them um, because the Bible speaks of the mind many times and how we have to uh, use them for God's glory. And so they're just as important to take care of your mind as, as to take care of your body. And these are several things that you can do. And I really would suggest that you at least, not one size fits all, but I just am suggesting some things to get you started. If you're not, you know, if you don't want to be athletic, but you just still want to do some exercise, uh, finding the ones that I use are Fabulous 50s now, of course, I, like you, would prefer to have exercise instructors that would read scriptures to me and sing hymns, but those are rare to find, and uh, and if you do find them, sometimes their exercises aren't so great. So I found one that I like, and that's the one I use. And I use the fabulous 50s lady from, uh, who's in, I believe, Sydney, Australia, and uh, I love seeing uh, Botany Bay in the background, <laughs> and, uh, but... I get dressed up and uh, as best I can and fix my hair and act like I'm going to a class. And this is one reason I suggest we start making things into courses and taking courses. And uh, do you remember that I had spoken to you before about making good things happen at home, creating events at home, and I've explained several of the events I've had, but turning things into events at home, because a lot of people miss their uh, cultural activities or things that they're used to doing, and we're used to having the rest of the world do things for us, but what about doing it for yourself and turning it, turning something, turning a day into uh, some kind of event, turning even just when you you sit down with your tea and a book that it becomes an event a memorable event if you have little children every move is going to be watched they are going to watch your habits they are going to watch the meaningful the things that seem meaningful to you they are going to watch what you do and that's why it's so important to think about what you do remember Hyacinth said in Wives and Daughters when uh, Cynthia was cutting up a bit and giving her a hard time she said something like I wish that she would apply herself to some kind of seriousness of purpose. <laughs> and so make good things happen. Have a serious purpose in what you do. Create, build, 
refine, go a little further, even in your housework. Don't just be satisfied to get it all done, but go a little bit further. Go further than necessary. Do it excellent, ex excellently and make a little progress in something. So now that I have given you your lecture, I'm going to give you an appropriate course, and it is the Jane Austen diet book, which is really just a Jane Austen Regency lifestyle book. And I'm really enjoying it now, aside from his somewhat um, salty language. Well, I don't mean he doesn't, uh, he doesn't say anything risque, but just sometimes, you know, it's just a little bit much for me. And uh, so, but, but I can overlook it because the whole idea here is so good. And I wish that someone would do this with some other types of, of stories too. And I did know someone once who could, when she was telling you uh, uh, people in the Bible and she had uh, the Betty Lucan's flannel graph and she could tell you while she told the story of Ruth or the story of Lydia or some Bible woman, she could tell you about their customs, about what they ate and drank, about how they slept, about their fabrics. And that was extremely fascinating because we need to know the culture has a lot to do with how we how we think about things and then when things are recorded and written they do include some of that so it's always good to look a little bit further like this man did he looked further than the comedic romances of Jane Austen and found other things in it found clues so you know maybe one day you'll find some clues about uh, your grandmother or your mother okay um, universal truth number four this is about the Austin body basics about how they felt about the human body uh, in general I mean I'm sure there's always people who were extreme and glorified uh, strength and perfection more than other people just like the ancient Greeks did uh, but this this is just or her books were considered quite ordinary. They were never considered by the uh, by the publishers or by the people of her time as classics like we do. So there are classics because they are they're just ordinary. Trusting your body to communicate your state of health, trusting your body at all for that matter, isn't exactly an on trend topic these days. And small wonder. The modern message couldn't be more aggressively conflicting. Our bodies are the real problem, the roadblocks to perfect health. Even the words we use on dieting regimens are veritable chorus of war cries. We must battle the bulge, fight cravings, resist temptations. Oh, I'm already feeling depressed. Whip ourselves into shape. <laughs> Getting healthy would be easy, yes, if only our wonky carcasses would raise the white flag. You know, that's some of that salty language he uses. Colorful language. Yet Austin, with characteristic elegance, saw things very differently. I am more convinced that I need to have a two-hour Austin World event at my house, which would include a meal and uh, a walk and some kind of activity, reading or writing or singing or maybe just a speech by someone about the Austin world and a, f a few other things, maybe something creative. I think I could manage that if lady, if there'd be anybody that would be interested. And uh, I do have a couple friends that have shown some interest in coming. <clears throat> Yet Austin with characteristic elegance saw things very differently. Hers is the elegance of the classical approach to health, a body philosophy dating back to ancient Greece and still very much alive in Regency England. An old, intuitive, encouraging idea, it goes something like this. Our bodies are naturally strong and resilient. They want to be healthy. They are a bit like plants, knowing exactly how to grow without us hovering obsessively over them though all plants, of course, need the right environment to flourish. That's where we come in. Our job is to do a little lifestyle gardening, providing the right food and environment for our bodies to do the best that they can. Then we step back and stop worrying. Nature has it covered. 
Regency doctors call it uh, the healing power of nature, something modern science is just beginning to understand. There are, for instance, stronger antioxidants naturally produced in our bodies, particularly the liver. Oh, the liver. I've talked to you about the liver. Everything goes passes through the liver, even the things you use on your skin, even your uh, detergents uh, in your clothing and your shampoos. That's why you have to be so careful as to what's in everything. There are, for instance, stronger antioxidants naturally produced in our bodies that rival anything, even superfruit, we could ever consume. Our brains, moreover, are walking pharmacies naturally dispensing chemicals so potent they could put many drug companies out of business. Our DNA is programmed for health. We simply need to cooperate. I have heard this many years ago. Uh, we knew a man uh, when I was growing up that thought that health was natural and that God programmed us that it was normal to be healthy, not normal to be sick, that uh, it was easier to be healthy and that uh, that it was the body would take to being healthy better. And uh, his whole attitude was that there has to be a way to find out how to be healthy because God created the body and he didn't create it to to not function. And uh, that really struck me as a young person how we were, we're supposed to be healthy. <clears throat> we simply need to cooperate. As Austin affirms in Mansfield Park, we are gifted by nature with strength, which is why you won't find much body bashing in her novels. Yes. I like that. To attack the thing that makes health attainable didn't make much sense to her. On the contrary, only Austin's nonsensical, comical, and unhealthy characters ever became over-anxious about their bodies. Mary Musgrove in Persuasion, for example, constantly suffers from an imaginary agitation of body weakness. They really did a good job of that in Persuasion when she went to see her sister and she was sickly and she was complaining and she couldn't figure out what it was. And Even crowded carriage rides sunk, her, rides sunk her completely, laying her up on the sofa for most of the day to recover. Mr. Woodhouse in Emma labors under a similarly bad body philosophy. For him, people are weak, delicate plants, needing constant care and obsessive coddling, a self-fulfilling placebo that makes him in turn frail and delicate in his own health. Emma desperately tries to keep Mr. Woodhouse from such thoughts throughout the novel, as does Austen in almost everything she wrote. From pride and prejudice to persuasion, her heroines never over-scrutinize their bodies because they rely on one empowering fundamental, that health, for most people, is one of the natural blessings of existence, the seeds of which they already possess. Interesting. That health, for most people, that health, for most people, is one of the natural blessings of existence, the seeds of which they already possess. Hmm. To approach health like Austin an Austin heroine, therefore, is to look outside one's body at the habits of life, as Jane puts it, that either weaken or improve what's naturally there to begin with. Everyone in the Regency era had his or her own ideas about what particular style of living made health flourish or flounder, as did Austin her unique insights occupying the following chapters. But the premise remains the same. Arrange these external factors correctly and your body like a resilient plant, resilient plant receiving some much needed TLC will naturally reboot towards its healthiest self and size. Your only responsibility along the way, as Lizzie brilliantly observes, is to gently nourish what is strong already. Yes, that's interesting. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, 
there had emerged as something new that was different from the Victorian era. I don't know how long it had been going on, maybe since the 1940s. But in the 1950s, everyone had the medicine cabinet in the bathroom full of pills and over-the-counter stuff. And uh, I suppose children could get a hold of it too. But uh, the era of herbal remedies and natural natural health aids and natural cures, you know, cures for your stomach ache, you know, drinking a mint tea for a, a tummy problem. Those uh, natural things were not even in existence when I was growing up in the 1950s. It had all been replaced by the medicine cabinet. And thankfully, in the 60s, it all began to, to reemerge. <clears throat> and now my medicine cabinet is out in the uh, garden and I have a, a herbal garden. And just about anything I need is out there. So like a resilient plant receiving some much needed TLC, your body will naturally reboot towards its healthiest self and size. Your only responsibility along the way, as Lizzie brilliantly observes, is to gently nourish what is already there. Dandelion detox, yes, now I've even had uh, doctors tell us to get some dandelion tea and drink it for detoxing the liver. The liver's uh, supposed to filter everything, but sometimes with the modern food, it gets uh, it it gets to need to have a cleanse. Jumpstart the healing power of nature with an Austin-approved detox dandelion tea. Widely available at most supermarkets, dandelion tea was approved highly by Jane's family doctor. Remarkably, for the same reason, it is still prescribed today. It's for liver disorder, says Jane, with modern studies confirming that drinking an occasional cup of dandelion tea can dramatically increase the detoxifying and cleansing power of your liver. It doesn't have much taste, and it looks like coffee. It's very dark, but, you know, as you finish drinking the cup, it's not too bad. But when you know it's good for you, it, it tastes a little better. It, it doesn't taste bitter or anything. It's just kind of bland. Um, but it kind of smells like chicory or coffee with chicory in it. So it isn't too bad. And I don't know why we were deprived of this back in the 50s. I believe in the 60s there was a, a health movement, especially on the east and west coast, where people were becoming more interested in the herbs. Universal truth number five, mutual civility. Truly embracing Austin's universal truths for yourself might take some time. Unlearning some of the worst dieting flaws and foibles I picked up from the modern life took me time too. Though as far as Jane is concerned, we're in better company than we realize. Every character in Austin world arrives in their stories with their own little flaws and foibles to work through as well. It isn't called pride and prejudice for nothing. But notice that it's only Jane's heroines and heroes who make it any effort to improve themselves along the way. Wasn't that all what Emma was all about? She wanted to improve herself. And she even said, what is the good of being nearly 21 when I have so much to learn and, and I haven't improved? <laughs> and she was particularly concerned about some of her character flaws and, uh, you know, like being critical, um, trying, to, um, trying to help someone to the point of... Uh, of uh, ordering their lives around <laughs> and um, you know that is a problem for any generation um, wasn't there a saying and it was you should be really frightened when you hear the words from the government I'm here to help <laughs> the same can't be said for Mr. Wickham Willoughby or the stubbornly stagnant Mrs. Norris instead the mark of a truly grounded Austinite is simply their willingness to grow, to become better, stronger, happier versions of who they already are. It's the same for Jane's approach to health. Now, some of you who are very clever ought to take 
uh, some paper and make a board game that is about these Austin characters and character, their character problems, and uh, and have organized one of these board games. Not every Austin beauty bursts onto the page with fresh life and vigor like Lizzie Bennet. Anne Elliot, for one, requires a few chapters to go from frumpy and faded to gradually having the bloom and freshness of youth restored. Marianne Dashwood likewise has some bad body beliefs to unlearn, too, mostly regarding the pitfalls of starvation diets. <clears throat> but sooner or later, improvement of health is always part of Austin's package for a happily ever after. That's quite an astute observation on this man's part to observe that health was a theme throughout these. And possibly she didn't intend for it be, to be that way, but because it was in her mind, and uh, it was her in her thoughts. It was translated to the page in many ways, and she used it in uh, forming her stories. To borrow Lizzie's endearing language, your body naturally improves upon acquaintance. The more you know how it works and what it needs to thrive, the better this cooperative relationship of health becomes. As it was with Darcy, from knowing it better, its disposition was better understood. You don't have to love your body right from the start. Love at first sight? Don't make Lizzie laugh. But you do have to respect it. Respect it enough to deem it worthy of wonderful improvements. Just a small, polite bow of mutual civility. Just the beginning of every great Austin romance. I have often said to have enough respect for yourself and for your body to treat it well. And the Bible does talk about this. It says glorify God in your body and uh, present your bodies uh, in a in a proper way and uh, just many other things and I think we do a great deal of harm to our bodies by listening to the media tell us what will fix this and what will fix that what will make this more enhanced or more beautiful and I just really think we should leave our children alone and tell them they're beautiful the way they are and don't give them all these complex unfortunately you can have a very good upbringing and a very uh, strong um, self-image in uh, biblically, and still be still be taken away by some of these things, particularly the products. Okay, so this is called our devouring plan: a heroine's guide to food. <laughs> I have a. I've decided to name my uh, my dining room the devouring room. <laughs> You can begin by unlacing your mental corset. Food is one of the few things in Austin world not governed by a strict rule of right. Jane advises no prim and proper parallels to our modern food regulations. You know, it's lovely when you can go to a restaurant and they have a list on the side of the menu of how much sodium there is in something or how much sugar there is in something. It kind of spoils the fun of it, though. And I always remembered the scenes of the original, uh, what was it called, uh, All Creatures Great and Small, the James Harriet stories, uh, when he took his wife Helen out to a local place for dinner, I just can't imagine that menu having all these details about the food on it. They were happy to be able to go eat out. Um. So Jane advises no prim and proper parallels to our modern food regulations, no Regency equivalents to the calories, zones, points, charts, nutrition labels, and glycemic index, indexes that keep our dietary posture in check. I'll never forget that when this first started, and it was a long time ago, several years ago, I uh, was in a different uh, town than I am now, different state, and I took a lady to lunch at a very nice place and it was uh, a bed and breakfast but they provided lunch uh, sometimes and I wanted to go but I didn't want to go by myself so I took her with me and she questioned the waiter as to what was in it what how it was cooked what was what kind of oils it was cooked in and I understand that um, 
but it was so uncomfortable and I did not enjoy the meal as much because she was so concerned about it and she talked about the food a lot when she ate it well I can't eat that and she'd put that aside and she'd say this has got this on it or this is probably uh, not grown in uh, such and such a soil and so pretty soon uh, there was just a blight on the whole thing it wasn't it, the experience wasn't any fun and I've always said to my children if you don't want to eat it don't say anything and don't make it obvious that you're putting it aside or not eating it but don't ruin everybody else's meal when it comes to food just one of the foundations of life itself yes how many uh, people have been emotionally harmed by the way that meals are conducted and the uh, and the severity at meal times and the unpleasant conversation and the uh, scolding and the even adults they'll do it to each other the scolding and the criticism while eating takes away the the enjoyment of it takes away the the social reasons for being there it, it uh, ruins it all it sabotages it For a gal who knows more about life's convoluted rules of conduct, from how to, how low to curtsy to how successfully flirt with a hand fan, when it comes to food, just one of the foundations of life itself. Yes, I like that. The foundations, one of the foundations of life itself. Jane seems as relaxed as a Regency rogue. I'm sure I do not care, says Catherine Moreland in Northanger Abbey. It is all the same to me what I eat. Eek, such shocking indifference. We'd half expect it to engender a whole world full of flabby flubdubs, lazy eaters with all manner of horrendous dining habits. What Jane gives us instead is the real shocker. Hers is a world where loosened attitudes toward food aren't the undoing of healthy heroines. They are the making of them. Where the less one says and stresses over food, the less one says and stresses over food, the more it effortlessly rested in its proper place where rational creatures are free to enjoy a healthy appetite without ever being controlled by it. The result is one of literature's least complicated and most enviable approaches to food on record, one of the rare moments when you can realistically imagine Jane Austen doing a sofa slouched impersonation of Scarlett O'Hara. Food, oh fiddle dee dee, mustn't fuss about that, silly. <laughs> the result is one of literature's least complicated and most enviable approaches to food on record. Easy for her to say, no doubt we'd all obtain the same nirvanic attitude towards food if we lived in the rosy glow of the Regency era. And I've often said that these books often, and even history books, may leave out the things that of ordinary life that we that it, mankind has suffered some the, since the beginning of time so that every era has uh, its wars and its uh, its problems and even in the Bible I've, I told you once when Jesus came to earth how many of the who the kings were at the time and what kind of war was going on it wasn't uh, the best of times <clears throat> One can only imagine the extent of our difficult food choices. Dear me, shall I go strawberry picking with Emma or nut gleaning amongst the hedgerows with Louisa Musgrove? Romance novel reality check. What can outdated Aunt Jane and her frilly tea cakes possibly know about our modern struggles with food? I may have read this one to you before. Actually not seeing these cakes for their calories is precisely what makes Jane's food philosophy so exquisitely valuable to us today. Food was never a caloric number for Austin, a soulless fragment of carbon energy to count and quickly scarf down. It was one of the dynamic comforts of life, and therefore something to develop a lifelong rational relationship with. Relationships are all that really matter to Jane anyway. And it's not exactly a Pulitzer Prize-winning statement to say that she was rather good at describing them. 
Austin's best romances have a zen-like balance between comfort and control. Eleanor falling head over heels in love with Edward while staunchly remaining mistress of myself. The same is true for Jane's approach to food. Love isn't the only desirable capable, uh, only desire capable of going astray in Austin world. Bad food romances are just as common. For all her misguided Lydia Bennett's characters who live only to flirt, there are only as many Hurst, Mr. Hurst, Tubby Bond, Vivants who live only to eat. Yes, there were those types there. So it's no coincidence that Austin's heroines, the characters who love the wholest, who eat the healthiest, enjoy the edible pleasures of life without allowing them to interrupt life itself. How do they do it, blithely bouncing from one Regency meal to the next? At first seems lost in the airy mystique of Austin's imagination, somewhat like Lizzie's elusive formula for falling in love and getting fabulously rich. Jane, however, is a bit more pragmatic when it comes to eating like a heroine. It's scattered throughout most everything she wrote, an elegant diet of mindsets, ideas, and mental tactics. She calls it our devouring plan in one of her earliest stories, recognizing even as a child that every heroine needs a thoughtful strategy for tackling food with tolerable composure. Later in her novels, our devouring plan would become Austin's own safety net for always keeping one's relationship with food in its proper place. To unlock its secrets is to strike at the heart of healthy eating no matter what the century. Time to throw out your calorie corset and rewire the way you approach food. Time to eat like it's 1811. Tolerably detached. For starters, let's clarify what I mean by developing a Regency relationship with food, lest I be hanged, drawn, and quartered by the Jane Austen Society for willful ineptitude. Because, as every Austen scholar knows, Jane never gets gushy over food. If anything, she constantly keeps her heroines from overdeveloping what she would call a warm attachment to it, a fact emotional eaters have never quite forgiven her. The only truly healthy food relationship in Austin world are the ones in effect that keep food at, at an emotional arm's length. We're losing our desire to eat across the table from other people, whether it's uh, because maybe we are, some people are sickened by the manners or just, you know, the sound of food being eaten, or maybe we're embarrassed about eating in front of people. But I think in a family, it's really important not to just give your children a piece of food and and uh, not sit down and share it with them and eat with them because it's a communal system. It's a, commun a way of communion. And how can people ever understand something like communion in church if they have not really communed in mealtimes with one another uh, traditionally from the beginning of time? although there were people that would eat on their own when they were out working or out in the fields it is meals are mentioned as being partaken with other people then i think it's really important not just to hand your children food throughout the day but to have a sit down time where they can eat and enjoy it and enjoy each other The only truly healthy food relationships in Austin world are the ones in effect that kept food at an emotional arm's length. Try as she might, Mrs. Jennings can't make picky foodies out of Eleanor and Marion. She was only disturbed that she could not make them choose their own dinners at the inn, nor exhort a confession of their preferring salmon to cod or boiled fowls to veal cutlets. We want to shout, get a grip, girls, it's only food. But that's exactly Jane's point. Food is meant to be regarded with minimalistic mental energy, as in Austin world, with a proper air of indifference. If there are to be any complicated fantasies, warm fuzzy feelings, or periodic swoonings, they are to be reserved for Mr. Pemberton Plumtree, your handsome neighbor down the lane, not the plum pudding in your larder. This could be, this could solve the question as to why it was considered at the time and even now in some circles very rude to compliment the food very rude to say oh this is so good 
because it was making more of it than it was thought proper. Uh, it was indulging. It was uh, not considered proper. Now, of course, we like our children to compliment our pie and the other things that we make. We like we like that, but I can see now why it wasn't done so much. <clears throat> Jane brilliantly understood the psychological pitfalls of doing so. To get any more personal, intimate, and emotional with food is to inevitably fall into dieting dangers. Tracy Mann explains it with perfect modern parallels in Secrets from the Eating Lab. Specifically, most people tend to be terrible at resisting daily food temptations when their relationship to food gets too touchy-feely. Imagine a box of donuts passed around the office, man tells us. To regard them with simple Austin-style indifference, they're just breakfast items, round pastries in a cardboard container, is to dramatically lessen their power. On the other hand, to overthink them, to remember your past donut romances, how the frosted mel frosting melted in your mouth, how buttery scrumptious it all smelled, how the first sugary bite made you feel is to back yourself into a complicated corner of cravings nearly impossible to resist. You'll end up eating the donut every time. It's why Austin constantly reminds us to keep our emotions away from food, to keep everything as natural and as simple as possible, insists Mrs. Elton in Emma. If only Dr. Grant got the menu, the corpulent clergyman of Mansfield Park is one of the worst food romancers in Austin world. He observes over food and prioritizes it with comical exuberance. The business of his own life is to dine, to eat, drink, and grow fat. Those familiar with the novel know what follows. I'm sure they would all think we were too obsessed with food. And I myself... Uh, over the years found myself thinking, oh, is it time for me to fix another meal? Must we eat? <laughs> uh, because when you're a homemaker and you eat at home, it's constantly, it's one of the biggest things. It says here, a while ago I read you that it was one of the basis of human life was the meal times and the eating. So as a homemaker, I particularly, I don't know about you, but constantly thinking about what's back there in the storage and what's available in the fridge and how, what I'm going to what I'm going to make for meals to keep them constantly going and or what I'm going what I need to replenish and of course maybe Jane didn't have to think about that they had their hired help to do that for them <clears throat> so I'll start over here if only Dr. Grant got the memo. The corpulent clergyman of Mansfield Park is one of the worst food romancers in Austin world. He obsesses over food and prioritizes it with comical exuberance. The business of his own life is to dine, to eat, drink, and grow fat. Those familiar with the novel knows what follow. What follows, thanks to a repeated habit of self-indulgence, constant stressing and quarreling over food, and three great institutionary dinners in one week. He eventually succumbs to apoplexy ap and death. Though as much as we may giggle at Dr. Grant's demise, hard not to when Austin practically calls him a balloon that would soon pop off, chances are we've all gone a bit Grant-like bonkers over food, too. Just think back to the last time you went to the grocery store hungry. Ooh, yeah, we're we've told do not go to the grocery store hungry. Or the last restrictive diet you struggled to maintain. Or even the last time you skipped lunch and drove past a billboard advertising a double decker burger and a large fry. I want to just make a comment there and that is that these uh, stretch exercise, chair exercises, any kind of exercise that you take, even if it's gentle, absolutely change the way you think about food. It changes your appetite, changes something in your mind. You no longer long for the, for the food. You no longer have cravings. I think that that is one of the secrets. Unfortunately, it's the hardest thing to get to begin to try. But you could go for a stroll and get fresh air because 
it balances the desire for food and the desire to be free of it. Just balances balances all out. How good were you at achieving a proper air of indifference toward food? Spectacularly terrible, no doubt. Fact is, most of us are absolute nutters when we're hungry, ravenously unable to concentrate on anything besides a running internal monologue of food, food, food. No, I couldn't possibly. Oh, look, more food. It's something science has known for decades, that the more we restrict in our lives and diets, the more we're doomed to obsess over it. Blame it on biology and your body's keen knack at keeping you alive. But there are a few things more hopeless at fighting than complex chemistry of your natural hunger hormones. Healthy food detachments are only possible when you're eating enough. That's true. When you've eaten enough and when it's uh, food that is very... Not not so much uh, uh, dramatically... Uh, pleasurable on the tongue, but uh, makes you feel good. You remember that old saying, a moment on the lips, forever on the hips, but they were talking about cake and they were talking about candy. They weren't talking about a salad. That Jane grasped this biological truth is evident by how she often reminds her characters to eat, to eat in a way that is fully naturally satisfying. Catherine Morland's embrace of life, her sprightly vigor, is regularly fueled by a good appetite. She eats when she's hungry, even late at night after a ball. It's the same appetite respect Emma Woodhouse is expected to have. One of the conditions for her going to the Coles evening party was her solemn promise that if she became, came home hungry, she would take something to eat. Emma passes on the same wisdom to an a hangry Frank Churchill, knowing that eating was often the cure for such incidental complaints. Do you remember they even put it in the movie Emma, in the 1990s movie Emma, where it was um, spoken about her taking something with her to eat or eating before she went. Go eat, she tells him. Another slice of cold meat, another draft of Madeira and water will make you nearly on a par with the rest of us. To get yourself likewise on par with Austin's heroines is to admit that you're not a dieting automaton with no biological needs. It's okay and even advisable to begin your relationship with food where Jane begins chapter 9 of Mansfield Park with one of the honest and refreshing acknowledgments it was first necessary to eat. So now let me read the rest of what he says in this little box that he's made here. Readers today tend to forget how progressive Jane's eating encouragements were for the time. Regency fashions promoted exactly the opposite, labeling eating itself as somehow indelicate, unwomanly thing to do. A woman should never be seen eating or drinking, said Lord Byron in 1812, insisting that she must eat what a thought, if she must eat, it should be something inher inherently feminine and becoming. Try finding that label in the supermarket. There was a time when you did not eat on the street when you were walking, unless there was a some kind of a fair going on in your town and they were selling food from uh, one of the food vendors. That was the only time you did it. And... We did eat in the car. Many of us took long trips and we had to eat in the car. But you didn't eat just at any old time. There were specific times set aside to eat. It was one of the first cultural fads that Jane ridiculed with biting wit in Love and Friendship, a short story written in her teens. Never, never will I so demean myself, says one of its stupider characters, with the mean and indelicate employment of eating and drinking. That Jane laughed at this idea so early on only proves how accurately she understood her main subject, love. A realistic love life, in fact, demands a realistic relation with food. 
Interesting. Scientists first discovered the connection in the 1940s in one of the first experiments in calorie restriction. They found that the more people dieted, eating only minimal amounts of food, the less romantically inclined they felt. Though the test subjects were all young and healthy, the joys of falling in love became too much trouble when they weren't getting enough to eat. Instead, food becomes their new possession, the only thing they could think, talk, and obsess over. That Jane's heroines don't do this, that they spend their most of the time thinking about love and not about food, is actually the best evidence they weren't dieting in the traditional sense. Because whatever people might think, Jane told her sister in 1813, an empty stomach is not the most favorable for love. This is interesting because there is probably not a day goes by in your life when I don't think there's anything wrong with discussing the food because we are, we are all pre preparing food uh, in this era that we live in. Most women at home do the food preparation, so we will discuss it and uh, talk about the food, the quality of it, and where we got it and, and the taste of it. And But when you serve the food, that's when it all comes back on you, all that effort, and someone's telling you there's too many calories in this or it's got too much of this or that, this and too many grams of this and this. And uh, pretty soon it, the fun is gone because most of us can remember those lavish Sunday dinners after church in which you just ate until you couldn't eat anymore, uh, but no one got fat. <laughs> and be, partly because I think there was no anxiety over it. I often wonder if uh, anxiety over food prevents it from properly assimilating in your body, and that's why it makes us fat. But I don't know. I'd have to experiment uh, with it and see if, see if I could have a piece of chocolate cake and laugh at the same time and, and not gain any weight. <laughs> so ladies, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Jane Austen Diet Book and next time we will read uh, more about the Heroine's Guide to Food called Our Devouring Plan. I love that name. And it's called Harmonized by Distance. So I have read this before, I think, but I'm not tired of it yet and until I, I'm still going through books, and if I find something else that is interesting, I will bring that to the table. So thank you for your prayers, and thank you for leaving comments. They are the things that give me ideas and keep me going. And uh, also, those of you who are new here, I'm happy to have you, and I hope you'll come back. So I'll talk to you later. Bye.